Hi, it's Katrina. Some technology from the ancient world just doesn't make any sense. Today I'll be showing you an astronomical instrument designed by the ancient Egyptians and a mysterious place that could be a stargate portal or the oldest world map, but I'll let you be the judge. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and let's go. The Stargate to Another Realm There is a rock in the small island nation of Sri Lanka that may have once been used to travel across the stars. For 1300 years, the city of Anuradhapura served as a mighty capital to a mighty empire. It was deserted in the year 993, and ever since, the Sakwala Chakraya has remained one of Southeast Asia's most enduring mysteries. So, is it an astrological landmark? or a real stargate. Legend has it that the city was founded in the year 377 BC by King Pandukabaya. It grew to become one of the most sacred cities in Asia, home to over 10,000 Buddhists, their temples, and some of the world's biggest stupas. It was a holy pilgrimage site for centuries, up until it was abandoned. But could it really have been an intergalactic connection? You'll have to be the one to answer that question based on what I tell you next. The myth of the Stargate revolves around a carving on a rock. It looks mystical for sure, though no expert has ever been able to tell what it really is. The Sakwala Chakraya is a circular symbol that looks almost like a map. It's decorated in bizarre sigils and swirling patterns. Many believe it to be a portal to otherworldly realms, but others think it is an old astrological map. So how does it work? Let's say for the sake of argument that it's a stargate and that it can open, leading to either another plane of existence or another universe. But how would it open? One theory is that it requires a specific magnetic frequency. Stargates only open for several seconds at a time when the magnetic fields of the sun and the earth overlap and certain particles collide. Keep in mind that this isn't an official scientific theory endorsed by mainstream researchers. Another theory is that it takes a finely tuned mind to open the portal. In front of the Sakwala Chakraya is a bench carved of stone. It looks as if the bench was made so that people could sit on it and stare straight at the portal. It certainly wasn't put there just so pedestrians could enjoy the view. This may have been so that Buddhist monks could focus their energy and send their spirit through the interdimensional portal on a great voyage. Or maybe they sent their physical bodies through the portal and never returned, like a sci-fi movie. What are your thoughts on Stargates? Are they real, or have people been watching too much Stargate SG-1? The Forgotten Merquette of the Egyptians Unless you have a smartwatch, your ordinary wristwatch probably isn't good for anything except telling the time. But in ancient Egypt, there was a fantastic device that could tell time and make astronomical observations. This is the remarkable history of the Merquette. The Egyptians called it the Instrument of Knowing. That's a pretty cool name for any swanky invention. Nobody knows when the first one was made or who the genius was behind it. Merquettes were definitely around in the year 600 BC, made from bronze and decorated with hieroglyphics. They were also inlaid with electrum, sometimes known as green gold. Electrum was used to coat pyramids and make jewelry in ancient Egypt. The device itself was designed to be elegant but simplistic. It was a straight bar, like a rod, made from either wood or bone. It was also attached to a weighted plumb line, sort of like a piece of fishing line with a heavy lure attached to one end. The plumb line was used to establish a vertical reference, ensuring that the merquette was positioned properly before taking any measurements. This is how it worked. By lining up the object with the North Star, you would then use a second merquette to establish the North-South Meridian. That's how they always get you. You have to buy two or the first one doesn't work. With all the lines oriented properly, you had a reference point to track the movements of the stars and other celestial bodies. You could also tell time in the middle of the night by observing where specific stars were in the sky in relation to the merquettes. This sounds really complicated, but for ancient Egyptians who used these things on a regular basis, it would have been quick and straightforward. Not as quick as looking at your watch, but still, it was pretty efficient. Merquettes were used for telling time at night, while sundials were used during the day. And I haven't even gotten to the best part yet! It's highly plausible, dare I say most likely, that merquettes were used to construct temples, tombs, and pyramids. These simple little devices could have helped align ancient structures in very specific ways. 
Burkett's may have helped ensure that certain pyramids pointed to certain constellations, maintaining the connection between the celestial realm and Earth. And now for a quick break, because it's shout out time. I want to give a big thank you to Sarah Collins. Thank you very much for the video recommendation and Rob Canavan for supporting this channel. Thanks guys. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. The Colossus of Constantine. All hail Emperor Constantine. At least that's what comes to mind when I see the colossal statue of the Roman Emperor. Look at this thing. Here's a photo of it from the Associated Press. There, Constantine moons in all of his pale glory with his golden robes, golden orb, and golden staff. He looks ancient, but it's just an illusion. The Colossus of Constantine arrived in Rome in 2022, and it will remain standing like a giant in the garden of the Capitoline Museums until 2025. He is 42 feet tall, and he is also an exact replica of the original Colossus that stood proudly in Rome 1,700 years ago. Emperor Constantine was born in 306 in what is now Serbia. In the city of Nis, you can even find a small plaque commemorating his birth. He would grow to become one of the most important leaders in Rome, mostly for his conversion to Christianity. Constantine changed the course of human history by converting Rome into a Christian empire. In the year 312, Constantine commissioned a massive statue of himself to be built. And that was exactly what happened. If the emperor wants a statue, then the emperor gets a statue. It even managed to stand tall for a few years before it was ripped apart and pillaged for its bronze. In the 15th century, fragments of the colossal statue started to turn up. A piece of the head, a piece of the hand, a shin, and a foot. The pieces were miraculously kept safe through the ages. Then, in 2022, a company called Factum Foundation spent three days scanning the surviving fragments. This allowed them to create a perfect 3D model of what the original statue looked like. That model was used to build the replica that's standing once again for the first time in 17 centuries. How awesome is that? I hope they do the Colossus of Rhodes next. The technology behind the enormous emperor wasn't anything particularly remarkable in the 4th century. It was originally made from brick, wood, and metal bars. This new one is made from an aluminum skeleton, with the exterior being marble powder, resin, and polyurethane. But even though the materials were simple, making such large statues in the ancient world seems like no easy feat. And the Colossus of Constantine wasn't even one of the bigger ones in the ancient world. Still though, the Colossus was a testament to how many awesome things the Romans built before the Dark Ages gripped Europe. How Toilets Destroyed the Romans One of the greatest achievements of the ancient world was when the Romans figured out plumbing, but it may have also been their downfall. It seems so simple today that you flush the toilet and your waste is carried away to be disposed of cleanly, but for a lot of years this wasn't the case. Then the ancient Roman plumbing system came into being. Romans had hot and cold running water and a complex sewage system. Public toilets don't seem appealing at face value. The idea of sitting on a public latrine in full view of 10 or 12 other people all doing their business is weird to us, but it was normal to the Romans. Underneath the rows of marble toilets were channels of running water that swept the waste away into the Roman sewers. The sewers were an engineering marvel of their own. They were installed under the city soon after Rome was built. By the 1st century BC, the Romans were using lead pipes to bring water directly into people's homes. This was a huge deal in the evolution of human society. Where would we be today without running water? Lead pipes seemed like a good idea, but may have had disastrous consequences. People alive today know all about the effects of lead, but the Romans didn't. Exposure to lead causes brain damage and central nervous system damage. People who survive lead poisoning are typically left intellectually disabled and stuck with behavioral problems. Those who don't survive perish horribly. By the second century AD, a large portion of the public was drinking clean water from lead pipes. Yes, the Roman plumbing system was better than anything that came after it until modern times, but it was deadly. Unknown to the Roman public, they were slowly destroying their brains. Research has shown that the lead in Rome's water supply skyrocketed. Many scholars have suggested that when Rome fell in 476 AD, 
it had a population of severely sick people. Generations of Romans had been sucking lead-tainted water into their bodies, unknowingly growing erratic, unpredictable, and downright dangerous. The granite sarcophagus nobody can explain. There are a lot of aspects of the Great Pyramid of Giza that seem to be unexplainable. You may have heard that it took 100,000 men, 27 years, and 2 million stone blocks to build the pyramid. You may also know that its internal chambers are empty, and that there are strange voids inside that could contain secrets. But there is one thing about the Great Pyramid that very few people know. Ask your neighbors after this video, and I almost guarantee that they'll look at you like you're an alien. Inside the Great Pyramid is a massive granite sarcophagus that doesn't make any sense. But shouldn't there be a sarcophagus in the pyramid? It is a giant burial tomb after all. Yes, but the sarcophagus is so ridiculously big that there is no mathematical way it could have been brought into the pyramid after it was built. Experts think the pyramid was built around the sarcophagus, almost like a containment device. There is very little conversation about the sarcophagus in the archaeological community when there should be more. The sarcophagus is located inside the chamber where Pharaoh Khufu was allegedly put to rest 4,500 years ago. I say allegedly because there has never been anything of his found in the pyramid. Not a bone, not a fleck of mummified skin, nada! Scientists only assume that Pharaoh Khufu was buried here and that his corpse was removed thousands of years ago for unknown reasons but there isn't any physical evidence of it. The sarcophagus is slightly smashed, perhaps when grave robbers stole the dead king's body long ago. Many of the granite slabs of the burial chamber weigh almost 10 tons. They would have needed to be installed after the sarcophagus was made, since the corridor is too narrow to move it through. It would have been like trying to fit a ginormous couch through your front door. No amount of twisting, yanking, or yelling would have gotten this sarcophagus into the finished chamber. Could the Egyptians really have designed the pyramid around a single granite box? And was the king even buried in it to begin with? There is always a chance that the pyramid is not at all what it appears to be. Tell me some of your theories in the comments! The First Hydraulic Telegraph Do you know what the first telecommunication device was? It is so old, it predates both World War I and World War II. It predates the Civil War, the English War, and even the Punic Wars that were waged between ancient Rome and their nemesis Carthage. The first real telecommunication device was made by a Greek in the 4th century BC. It was a hydraulic telegraph, an ingenious device that was able to send messages long distances over 2,000 years before Alexander Bell. It was designed by a brilliant tactician whose name happens to be Aeneas Tacticus. You can't make this stuff up! Aeneas Tacticus was inspired to design his new machine thanks to the vast empire that Alexander the Great was forming. Alexander had increased the territories of the Greeks so much that communication was becoming a problem. Getting a message from somewhere in Western Europe to the other side of the empire in Asia took a seriously long time. The message would have to be delivered by an actual messenger, either someone on a horse or a bird with a scrap of paper tied to their leg. Yes, bird messengers were really used in the ancient world. Scientists think that homing pigeons were used as part of a postal service in Egypt about 3,350 years ago. The Romans described using pigeons to deliver military messages in the first century, but Aeneas didn't want to rely on pigeons or people. He wanted to rely on a trustworthy machine, so he developed a hydraulic telegraph to send messages over vast distances. Specifically, the communication network would be used for military purposes. The system worked like this. Army A wanted to communicate with Army B. They each had a messenger waiting at the top of a large hill within sight of one another. When the message was about to come through, Army A waved a torch. When the messenger of Army B saw the torch, they would raise their own torch. This established communication. The messengers knew they were now in sync, and the message could be delivered. Each messenger had a clay or a metal jar with a hole drilled into the bottom that was plugged with a cork. When they established communication, both of the messengers unplugged their corks at the same time. The water in their buckets would begin to drain at the same speed. And as this was happening, previously arranged messages would appear written on a rod in the bucket. 
When Army A saw the message they wanted to send, they waved their torch, signaling them to plug the hole. Because both clay jars and the messages written on the rods were the same, Army B would get the message clear as day. Maybe it wasn't that technologically advanced, but it was clever enough to serve armies. And although Army A and Army B had to be within eyesight of one another, there could theoretically be many other messengers waiting atop other high vantage points. Using this method, all sorts of messages could be delivered in record time. Armies could request reinforcements or sound the retreat. The Most Legendary Temple of Hercules The biggest temple ever built by the Romans is not in Rome. But can you guess where it is? If you guessed Amman in the capital city of Jordan, you are correct and should give yourself a round of applause. The Temple of Hercules was one of the largest temples ever built by human hands. It's so big that it was never even finished. The place is in ruins now, much of its history forgotten or erased by the sands of time. But archaeologists are still in awe over the fact that such a place was ever built. But how big was it really? Positively humongous. The inner sanctum was around 100 feet long and 85 feet wide with the outer sanctum measuring 400 feet by 236 feet. It wasn't just girthy, it was long too. The temple's columns were 33 feet tall. Nobody knows how tall the roof was or what the temple may have looked like once it was completed. The unadorned columns and lack of certain parts make it clear that the project was abandoned before it could be finished. The unfinished temple was only one piece of a jaw-dropping landscape. In the 1st century BC, the Romans took over the 10 cities of the Decapolis region in Jordan, including Amman. For the next 400 years, the city was part of Rome. It became a haven for sculptors and engineers. Statues and monuments filled the ancient city like traffic lights fill modern cities. There were other temples dedicated to Hercules. There were towering statues of gods, heroes, and emperors. But everybody's favorite character was clearly Hercules. He was all over the place. In the ruins of the Great Temple, excavations revealed a giant broken hand. The hand belonged to what might have been the largest marble statue in human history. The hand, which still lies in the ruins of the temple, only has three of its fingers left. And based strictly on those three fingers, scientists know the original statue of Hercules stood at least 40 feet tall. It was made entirely of marble, which is almost unbelievable. To give you a comparison, the famous statue of David is only 14 feet tall. The Hercules in Amman would have made David look like a garden gnome. Greek Gastronomy This next one is for the foodies out there. I want to tell you about the father of gastronomy, an ancient Greek philosopher who lived almost 2,500 years ago. His name was Archistratus. He was one of the first people that scientists know about who took gastronomy seriously. Archistratus was a mix between a food critic, an ancient yelper, and a food blogger. In the 4th century BC, Archistratus advised people where they could find the best food in the Mediterranean. Of course, he didn't do it in an actual blog, but rather in a poem. All the best writing in ancient Greece was done in poem form. His poem was called Hedipathia, which translates roughly to life of luxury. Unfortunately, though, it's been lost for eons. There are only about 62 fragments of it that have been found across the ancient world. That sounds like a lot, but it isn't. All those fragments equate to roughly 300 lines. The lines aren't even from the original poem, but from a copy written down by a Greek scholar 600 years later in 228 AD. The 300 lines were copied down in his own book called Philosophers at Dinner. If you think some of the books down at your local bookstore are kooky, you'd be baffled by the volumes in ancient Greek libraries. But what does this have to do with technology? I'm glad you asked, because Archistratus made a history with his food research. Many would argue that Archistratus' advancements in gastronomy were just as important as early advancements in medicine, and I'll explain why. Although his great poem isn't around anymore, historians still know about the contributions he made. Archistratus approached cooking as an art and a science. He noted how consuming fish and a certain amount of wine was ideal for healthy living. Even the word gastronomy comes from Archistratus, meaning rules of the stomach. 
The foods he was so obsessed with are still part of the healthy modern Greek diet today. He introduced rules that are still used in modern times. Some of these rules include using raw food materials of only the best quality, avoiding hot sauces and hot spices, using lighter sauces to enjoy a meal, and combining everything harmoniously. And who are some of the longest living people in the world? The Greeks. Greece is one of the five recognized blue zones where people live longer than the average bear. And it could be thanks to one clever poet who laid down the rules of healthy eating 24 centuries before today. The Impossible Siberian Megaliths An expedition was recently headed by Georgi Sidorov and a team of scientists, including researchers like Dr. Valery Uvarov from the National Security Academy of Russia. The photographs they released upon their return are fantastic. They show enormous megaliths that the team believes to be the remnants of ancient structures. Structures so big that they couldn't have possibly been built without seriously advanced technology. Here's one of the images, the picture from Georgi Sidorov. At first glance, it doesn't look that interesting. There are some trees and what looks like a large stone wall behind them. But when you look a little closer, like in this image here, which is also from Sidorov, you can see that the stones look more like blocks. They look like huge rectangular building blocks stacked one upon the other like the bricks of an old house. The expedition team journeyed into the mountains of Gornaya Shoria, which is located in southern Siberia. People have always known that these large stone walls are in the mountains, but nobody's ever been able to confirm them to be artificial structures. Most scientists dismiss the megaliths as being made by Mother Nature, not human hands. You have to have a bit of imagination to see the scope of this marvelous place. Each stone is roughly 60 feet long and 18 feet tall. They are all straightforward rectangular blocks, obviously carved with symmetry in mind. Some of them are spaced so widely apart that they create little shelters. Many of the stones show burn marks, which were documented by the scientists on their expedition. Some of the rocks also appear to have melted in some places. If these are real megaliths carved by human hands, as the team of 20 scientists believe to be the truth, they are the biggest blocks ever made. They are even bigger than the biggest monolith at Baalbek, which weighs approximately 1,650 tons. As for what it means in the scope of history, a civilization must have lived here once. The civilization was able to cut and move stones of unimaginable weight. The only way to move these blocks would have been with heavy machinery, or with some other, more magical means of movement. Perhaps a race of giants lifted them onto their backs. Perhaps a culture had mastered the manipulation of sound waves to move mountains. Secrets of Bolivia's Sun Gate In Bolivia, Puerta del Sol stands as a testament to the abandoned technology of the ancients. Puerta del Sol is the Spanish name for this monument, called the Gate of the Sun in English. But the culture who built it spoke neither language. They were the Tiwanaku, masters of Bolivia starting around the year 400 AD. It was just before Rome wheezed its final breaths that the Tiwanaku culture flourished in the region around Lake Titicaca. Their capital was the city of Tiwanaku, from which their name originates. It stood at a dizzying elevation of over 12,500 feet above sea level. The Gate of the Sun is still standing in the ruins. It's just shy of 10 feet tall and approximately 13 feet wide. It was carved from a single piece of stone using a precision that seems impossible. The contours, corners, and perfect lines of the gateway look like they were made using lasers. I should also tell you that the gate stands in the middle of nothing with the doorway leading to nowhere. Most archaeologists agree that the gateway was brought to its current location from somewhere else, but they can't say where it came from or why it was moved. Not a single person alive right now knows what the Gate of the Sun was used for, though all the experts agree that it's covered in astronomical symbols. These symbols could be the clues needed to solve its mystery. The central figure on the gate is a deity called the Staff God, who's associated with the movement of the sun. Other carvings appear to represent solstices and equinoxes. One of the prevailing theories among archaeologists is that the gate was used as a calendar to mark the passage of time. This makes sense because the Tiwanaku culture excelled in the school of astronomy. They could have easily tracked the movements of the planets. 
But what if it was used for something a little more alien? There is a theory floating around that the gateway was once used as a portal to another place or another dimension. It could be covered in astrological symbols because it was a literal gateway to the cosmos. Before moving on, you should know that the Gate of the Sun is only one monument within a much larger ruin. It's surrounded by four square miles of pyramids, temples, and even the mysterious site of Puma Punku. The First Coppersmiths Ancient Native Americans often get a bad rap for being technologically behind the curve. Europeans had guns when they arrived in America. They had great ships and huge cities back home, while Native Americans were still shooting arrows. They often lived in nomadic communities, and instead of ships, they had canoes. But 10,000 years ago, Native Americans were way ahead of the curve. New research has shown that the old copper culture was one of the first societies to learn how to shape certain metals. You can likely gather from their name that they were experts in copper tools. In the Stone Age, a group of hunter-gatherers were living next to Eagle Lake in Wisconsin. They hammered conical projectile points made from pure copper and lashed them to sticks. These points were honed to be incredibly sharp and deadly. They were arrows designed to take down big game animals. There weren't many other cultures in the world who had figured out how to make copper tools yet. 10,000 years ago, the Native Americans of the Great Lakes were among the best scientists in the world. They learned how to mine ore from deep underground, heat it, bash it with something hard, and then grind it into a tool. They didn't just make arrows, they also had knives, axes, fish hooks, and other objects that would continue to be used by their descendants for the next… well, they're still being used today. But there's a bit of a mystery that scientists are having a tough time solving. The old copper culture stopped making copper tools about 5,400 years ago. They just quit and no more copper tools were made for the next 3,000 years. It's a mystery because most civilizations don't throw away superior technology. Yet for three millennia, the Native Americans either forgot how to make copper tools or decided that it wasn't worth it. They went from using hard metal back to using stone and bone. Archaeologist Michelle Beber from Kent State University said the copper tools may not have been that much better. Michelle recently replicated knives and arrowheads just like the Stone Age Native Americans would have made. Comparing them to stone and bone implements, Michelle found that there wasn't a big difference. Unless someone can go back in time and ask why they gave up copper, scientists will only ever be able to speculate. Still, now you know that the Native Americans were just as clever as other cultural groups of the ancient world. Researchers believe it's likely they just didn't see the need to move beyond their basic technologies, seeing as they already had everything they needed. This artifact doesn't make sense. Archaeologists in Greece have been captivated and confused by a strange statuette. They can't explain what the statuette is, they don't know where it came from, and they can't even say how it was made. The object is old, older than it looks. It was carved 7,000 years ago from a solid chunk of granite. 7,000 years ago was during the Stone Age, so whoever carved the statuette had likely belonged to a nomadic culture of hunter-gatherers. But then again, maybe not. Like I said, scientists are a little confused. The thing that's puzzling researchers the most is that the statuette shouldn't exist. It was carved from granite without using any metal tools, which doesn't make any sense. It's also bigger than almost every other Neolithic statue ever found. It's 14 inches tall, carved into the likeness of what might be a bird. It's really difficult to say what the statuette is. Maybe you can take a look for me and let me know what you think. Here's a close-up of its head with what looks like a pointy beak. The image is from the National Archaeological Museum of Athens. Some experts are saying it's a bird, but others are thinking it's humanoid. It's all up in the air right now. Katja Mantelli from the museum in Athens said it's one of the rarest works of Greece's Neolithic period. She suggested that it could be a bird deity or a pregnant woman, though there is no obvious indication of gender. The statuette could even symbolize an asexual anthropomorphic creature from ancient myth that's been lost for thousands of years. But what I want to know is how it was made. Researchers think it was a product of rock on rock meaning that someone sculpted the granite statuette by bashing it with a stone. Typically, you would need a metal tool to create something like this. 
Is it possible that Neolithic Greeks discovered the miracle of metal long before the Bronze Age? Restoring the past in Peru Ancient technology never truly goes out of flavor. Indigenous communities in Peru are currently working to restore forgotten tech that's been collecting dust for 3,000 years. In the central Andes of Peru, the heat is becoming a problem. The rain isn't falling like it used to. Glaciers are retreating. It's getting hot and dry, leaving indigenous communities in a bit of a bind. They need more water to save their livestock and their crops. So they are turning to technology used by their ancestors. In the villages of Miraflores and Canchayo, communities have begun to restore dams, canals, and reservoirs that were made by their ancestors three millennia ago. The Inca and the civilizations who came before them constructed terraces and cisterns to help the mountain water move more slowly through the grasslands. This helped keep the grass green and the aquifers full. When the grasslands retain more water, more biodiversity flourishes. This means less floods, less drought, healthier animals, and more cheese. It also means more potatoes, corn, and tubers. Now who doesn't like a good tuber? And already things are looking up. The pastures have improved, with cattle and alpacas having more food to eat. Crop yields have also risen, giving the 9,600 people in the area hope for the future. Sure, it costs a bit of money and required the aid of a U.S. nonprofit group called the Mountain Institute. But at the core, the Peruvians used pre-Inca technology that already existed to save themselves from destruction. Thanks for watching! What do you think was the most impressive technology of the ancient world? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Stick around for an older video that you might have missed. The Vimana Flying Machine the Vimana is a legendary flying machine that appeared in ancient Indian texts over 2,000 years ago. There isn't one place in particular where the Vimana is mentioned, but rather in multiple Sanskrit manuscripts, texts, and old pictures. Images of these flying machines can be found everywhere in old Hindu paintings, drawings, and temple carvings. They are mentioned in all of the most important Hindu epics referred to as flying chariots driven by the gods. In some images, the Vimana is a massive floating palace, and in other images, it's a flying chariot being pulled by magical horses. The one thing all the depictions of the Vimana have in common is that it flies. The Indian philosopher Dayananda Saraswati believed the Vimana was a real flying spacecraft witnessed by Indians over 3,000 years ago. They then incorporated the flying machine into their lore and stories, and it became a vessel used to carry the gods. There has never been any official archaeological evidence that the ancient people of India ever created a flying machine, and yet they do appear to have at least seen something to give them the inspiration. They may have had encounters with UFOs, or if we're being practical, the Vimana may have just been a fun idea. The Sphinx Buffer A recent routine excavation at the legendary Sphinx of Giza has revealed an ancient piece of advanced technology. According to the Supreme Council of Antiquities, researchers discovered the remains of an old wall that had been built to protect the Sphinx from erosion caused by blowing desert sands. Archaeologists came across two segments of the mud wall, each one standing just about three feet tall. One of the walls was immense running 282 feet between the Sphinx and the pyramids. The other wall on the other side of the Sphinx was found to be about 151 feet long. This has been a monumental discovery because it shows the remains of an enclosure that had totally blocked off the Sphinx. The wall seemed to confirm an old story from Egyptian texts about how King Tutmos IV had a dream in which the Sphinx asked him to clear the sand around its body. The Sphinx promised that if the king restored the statue, he would become the supreme leader of Egypt. And so Tutmos IV cleared the sand from around the base of the Sphinx and built monumental walls to protect it from natural hazards. This is incredible because the walls would have been built between roughly 1400 and 1390 BC. The construction of the Sphinx itself was a great use of advanced technology, but to learn that the king had built a wall to protect the monument from natural erosion 
shows just how much the ancient Egyptians truly understood about architecture and about the process of erosion. Da Vinci's Weapons Long before helicopters, aircrafts, or weaponized tanks were used on the battlefield, Leonardo da Vinci was busy imagining how such war machines might work. Most people remember Leonardo as a brilliant painter, the guy behind masterpieces such as the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. But he was also an avid inventor way ahead of his time, coming up with highly advanced designs for weaponry centuries before his ideas would be implemented in the real world. Leonardo was born in Florence in 1452 and lived a long life of success before passing away at the age of 67 in 1519. During his 67 years on the planet, he delved deep into the world of science. He made discoveries of engineering, revelations about friction, lubrication, geology, and he painted like his life depended on it. One of his most fascinating mobile weapons was the tank, the very first truly modern tank ever invented. It looked almost like a UFO. The tank consisted of a heavy base with four wheels, a ring of heavy cannons mounted in the middle, and an angled circular dish for protection. It was like a UFO on wheels, with 32 cannons able to shoot in every direction. Whoever manned the tank would be invincible inside the metal shielding and able to drive straight into enemy lines while blasting their cannons. The tank never saw mass production, as it wasn't seen as something feasible in the 15th century. It was just too far ahead of its time. So too was one of Leonardo's other inventions, the first driverless vehicle. He created a wind-up tricycle propelled by springs. The driverless vehicle would propel itself in any given direction thanks to its genius gear system. It could be used as a weapon by filling it with gunpowder and sending it driving into a group of enemies. But just like the armored tank, it too never saw any use in the real world. Sutton Hoo's Treasure Workshop In 1939, the Sutton Hoo burial ground in England became one of the greatest treasure discoveries in modern archaeological history. The grave contained the remains of a massive ship, a fully functioning vessel 88 feet long. The ship was filled to the brim with riches, acting as a kind of burial chamber for an unknown Anglo-Saxon king who died in the 7th century. It was an incredible discovery and one that people are still talking about today. But what scientists have always wondered is where in the world all that treasure came from. In 2022, archaeologists found evidence of a medieval workshop in England where many of the artifacts in the burial likely came from. The treasure workshop is about three miles from where the burial ship was found. Researchers uncovered proof of metalworking, craft production, and even weaving going back 1400 years. Fragments of spindle whorls, a buckle made from a copper alloy, and scraps of slag from smelted ore. Clearly, this was a big production site. What it appears we have here is one of the world's first major production sites almost on par with the manufacturing industry during the Industrial Revolution. There would have been many people working at the factory, all of them skilled laborers whose job was to create mass amounts of quality treasure. This was likely the first time the world, or at least England, saw highly advanced materials being produced in mass quantities and with shocking speed. Big shout out to Bubbles Activated and Dida M. Thanks so much for your support. If you are new here, welcome, and be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. The Folding Chair In Germany, archaeologists unearthed a strange piece of advanced technology. While digging through an early medieval woman's grave in Bavaria, researchers found a chair. But this was no ordinary chair. It folded. As ridiculous as the whole thing may seem, this folding chair from 1,400 years ago is one of only two such examples found in Germany. It was designed and built in the 6th century, constructed from iron and made for maximum comfort. It was such a valuable item that when its owner passed away in her 40s, it was buried with her as a grave good. The Bavarian State Office for Monument Protection released a statement giving details on the exceptional discovery. When folded, the chair compacted to about 27 inches by 17 inches, meaning it would have been easy to carry from one place to another. 
It was very similar to a modern folding lawn chair, like what you might see at the beach, except a lot heavier. This mysterious woman may have been one of the only people in Bavaria at the time relaxing in comfort on her very own portable folding chair. Roman Turrets Hadrian's Wall was a massive undertaking that began in the year 122 AD. Roman Emperor Hadrian, who was at the time the ruler of Roman-occupied Britain, needed to build a strong defensive fortification to keep the unruly tribes of the north out of his territory in modern England. It took seven years to build and was composed of at least 16 stone fortresses. These fortresses were built periodically along the 73 miles of wall, which stretched from the North Sea to the Irish Sea. It wasn't just a wall, but a fully garrisoned line of forts, turrets, supply depots, and bulwarks to keep the invaders at bay. It was a highly sophisticated project, even for the Romans. Recently, archaeologists were excavating a chunk of Hadrian's Wall near Newcastle. They uncovered a piece of the wall ditch, some obstacle pits in front of the wall meant to swallow would-be attackers, and a highly advanced Roman turret. The turret was little more than some broken foundations long since covered with dirt, but when the turret was functional, it acted as a watchtower incorporated directly into Hadrian's Wall. The turret would have had battlements, from which watchers could keep an eye on the lands beyond the wall. It wasn't the most advanced piece of technology in the world, but it was an important piece of an unbelievably well-designed fortification, something almost as impressive as the Great Wall of China. Ancient Cheese Making Not every advanced ancient technology was mechanical or architectural. For example, researchers in Egypt have just discovered extremely well-preserved pieces of cheese from 2,600 years ago. They were found in the archaeological zone of Saqqara by researchers with the Ministry of Antiquities, along with other artifacts from between 664 and 404 BC. The cheese came in large blocks of halloumi, which was made using an ancient recipe of goat and sheep milk. The cheese was so expertly crafted that it still looked almost edible when it was found inside of large clay vessels. No one knows when exactly the Egyptians learned how to create their delicious cheese. But for context, the oldest cheese ever discovered was only a little older, from 3,200 years ago. That was also found in Egypt in 2018. It too was made mostly from sheep and goat milk, and probably had a really nasty acid flavor, according to chemistry professor Paul Kinsett. We now know the Egyptians were not only highly advanced when it came to creating monuments, temples, and pyramids, nor were they only at the forefront of math and anatomy. They were also leaders in the creation of unpasteurized dairy products. Cloaca Maxima In the 6th century BC, the Romans built what at the time may have been the greatest invention in the world. They created the most effective water drainage system Europe had ever seen. They called it the Cloaca Maxima, or the Greatest Sewer. It's one of the oldest monuments in Rome, although it's not quite as glamorous as places like the Pantheon or the Colosseum. It's little more than a glorified drainage pipe, and yet you have to respect the fact that it's been standing for 2,600 years. When it was first built, the Cloaca Maxima was intended to help carry stormwater from the city of Rome down to the river Tiber. Because Rome was built on marshlands, the rainy season often meant devastation and mosquitoes. To prevent rainwater from washing Rome away every year, the sewage system was implemented. It wasn't until about 300 years later that the massive open drain was covered and waste from public latrines and baths was pumped into the system. Later still, in the first century, after the Roman Republic had transformed into the Roman Empire, the sewer system underwent massive upgrades. The whole thing was cleaned and expanded, and the flow from 11 different aqueducts was added. 700 years after its initial construction, the sewage system was still going strong. The greatest sewer remained functional throughout the Byzantine period until at least the early 1500s. However, it was highly neglected with the fall of Western Rome. These days, nothing more than a small trickle of water flows through its tunnels. The oldest structure in the Americas 
A new study has discovered the oldest human-made structure in the Americas. This thing is older than the Egyptian pyramids and is passed by thousands of students a day. It's located on the property of Louisiana State University's campus. At the northern end of the campus are two grassy mounds that look like nothing more than hills. The biggest is about 20 feet tall, and there are about 800 others like it found throughout Louisiana. These mounds were built by Native Americans a very long time ago. And while researchers knew they were old, it wasn't until this study that they realized just how old. The oldest of all the mounds is 11,000 years old. That's the oldest human-made structure in both North and South America, according to study author Brooks Elwood. Hiding underneath the grassy surface of the mound are layers of clay, dirt, and ash. That's because the mound was created over decades and centuries through ritual activity. The local civilization in Louisiana built the mound by stacking up clay and burning plants. It was a primitive yet ingenious way of making artificial mini mountains. The weird part is that no one understands why. Scientists assume ritual activity, but they don't know what kind of rituals were going on. They also don't know why the two mounds at LSU are so different. One is 11,000 years old, the other is 7,500 years old. The first one was abandoned and then the other one began to be built, but nobody has the faintest clue as to why. Chinese Bronze Researchers from the UK have just identified ingredients used by Chinese bronze makers 2,500 years ago. These ingredients were used by some seriously genius scientists to create bronze alloys. Historian Rui Liang Yu from the British Museum, with help from archaeologist A.M. Pollard, were the ones to make this phenomenal discovery. They found two copper-rich alloys, identified only as Jin and Qi, that were staples of early Chinese bronze production. These alloys show just how shockingly advanced the Chinese metal-making techniques were. Chinese scientists used a sophisticated formula as far back as 700 BC to produce various types of bronze depending on which items needed to be made. With the bronze material, forge masters were then able to create everything from swords to delicate musical instruments. The alloys Jin and Qi were made from mixing copper, tin, and lead. The ancient Chinese manufacturers figured out a way to dilute copper with various other materials to create entirely unique alloys, which could then be used to make far more advanced metals than ordinary copper, which was the most popularly used material at the time. It was a big boost for science and a huge step forward for civilization. The Watchtowers of Argon Gorge The famous Ushkaloi Twin Towers of the Argon Gorge are located in the heart of Chechnya. The gorge itself has been home to countless cultures, filled with roughly 600 monuments of ancient history, archaeology, culture, and nature. The gorge was used as a pass for caravans during the Middle Ages and was home to nomadic tribes who lived in the impassable jungles and sheltered against the steep rock walls. Here you can find cave grottos, burial tombs, ancestral crypts from the 10th century, and even ruined castle complexes. But by far the most striking pieces of advanced ancient engineering are the towers which dominate the skyline atop bridges and mountain peaks throughout Chechnya. In general, these architectural wonders are called Vinak Towers and range anywhere from 30 to 75 feet tall. Some towers were used as residential structures, built in medieval settlements like Erzi and Nikaroy. Others were built as military installations. The oldest of them all date back 2,000 years. The Ushkaloi Twin Towers themselves, known as the Great Watch Houses over the Gorge, are only about 900 years old. What makes them especially fascinating is that they were built out of the solid rock of the Gorge, guarding the pass. Nobody would have been able to move through the passage without walking past these imposing towers. The ingenuity of such a design feat is impressive, and even more impressive that the towers haven't yet crumbled. The Inca Road System 
There is a lot of talk about how great the ancient Roman roads once were, and while it's true that the Romans did develop an impressive system of roadways to connect their empire, they weren't the only ones. Thousands of miles away on the other side of the world, the Inca were also tying together an empire using roads. There are thousands of miles of pathways in South America, all created by the Inca so their people could travel across their vast kingdom. Inca roads were made from interlocking stones, laid across some of the most epic landscapes on the planet. These roads can be found on the coast, high up in cloud forests, and are in six modern-day countries. One of the ancient passageways is still used on a daily basis by tourists who climb to Machu Picchu. According to Ramiro Matos with the Smithsonian National Museum, there could be up to 37,000 miles of roadways built by the ancient Inca, winding through Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, and of course Peru. It's amazing because the vast empire didn't have a writing system that we've found yet. They didn't even use the wheel in any practical sense. And yet they built one of the greatest road systems the world has ever seen. It was complete with interstates, major highways, local roads, and dirt paths leading into the more rural parts of the empire. The road operated for less than 100 years, active from between 1450 to 1532. Sadly, when the Spanish arrived, they were able to use these roads to conquer the entire Inca Empire more easily. The roads led the Spanish conquistadors from city to city as they launched an endless assault and subjugated the natives. Leonardo's Mechanical Knight In roughly 1495, the great inventor Leonardo da Vinci came up with a technology long before his time. He created a mechanical knight, or an automaton knight. It was a humanoid robot that functioned kind of like a giant steel puppet. The blue Blueprints for the robot were uncovered in sketchbooks belonging to Leonardo da Vinci that were dug up in the 1950s. In his notes, he claims that he showed the machine at a festival in the court of Milan with great success. The robot could stand, it was able to raise its visor, and it even maneuvered its arms independently. It obviously didn't have artificial intelligence or any kind of electronics, but it was the first functional robot to come to life. Its robotic systems were worked by a series of pulleys and cables rather than hydraulics and switches. Although the actual robot has never been found, we know Leonardo da Vinci's design really did work. After the sketchbook was discovered, modern scientists built their own version of the robot in 2007, exactly as the design was described in his journal. They discovered it to be 100% functional. Even clad in heavy medieval armor, it still mimicked human motions. The Pyramids of Palau The Pyramids of Palau are some of the most highly advanced pieces of engineering from the ancient world. Recently, archaeologists conducted studies of these pyramids located on the island nation of Palau. They uncovered both the construction methods and how much work it took to build them. There was a large team of researchers involved, with everything from soil scientists to ordinary archaeologists. They concluded that the ancient builders used volcanic rock and a huge quantity of ceramics to form the base of each pyramid. They then then created the upper layers using a specific kind of soil. Unlike many pyramids across the world that were used as temples or tombs, these were used for horticulture. At the summits of the pyramids, food was grown to feed the island residents. This is a pretty exciting revelation. On this isolated island in Oceania, there was a culture of people who cared more about food and prosperity than burying their leaders in monumental wastes of resources. They built pyramids simply to grow food, although some were used as burial sites. At the tops of some of these pyramids, Pyramids, researchers have found bones, but for the most part, this was all agricultural. Even more amazing is that the development of these pyramids and the complex society on Palau started sometime around 500 BC. The construction of the pyramids didn't happen overnight either. It took generations. Millions of tons of soil had to be moved by workers, something that was only possible in a politically organized society that didn't squabble amongst themselves. The fact that the pyramids took hundreds of years to complete proves shocking stability in the governance of the island. This really was a remarkable culture, both for their engineering feats and for their ability to work towards a single achievable goal. Boring through granite One of the biggest mysteries when it comes to technology from the ancient Egyptians is that they bored straight through granite. Sure, the Egyptians had advances in medicine, astronomy, writing, culture, and more, but it's really their stonework and the fact that they were able to cut and drill straight through granite that makes them almost unbelievable. Granite is specifically important in this case because it's considered far more difficult to cut and manipulate than softer rocks like limestone and sandstone. Right now, the mainstream view of archaeologists is that the ancient Egyptians achieved this feat using copper, bronze, and wood. Egyptian masons put these three things together to create highly 
advanced tools that bored through granite. There were others who insist the Egyptians used advanced technology handed to them by a group of superior beings. The truth is we haven't found definitive evidence in either case. We've obviously never found ancient Egyptian batteries to suggest they were using modern technology, and we also haven't found any serious copper brass mechanisms that could have worked drills through the hard rock. Right now, we just have to assume the Egyptians were seriously ingenious and put simplistic tools to really good use. Persian Refrigerators About 2,400 years ago, Persian engineers built the world's very first refrigerator. It didn't have coils and it wasn't small enough to fit in the kitchen, but it did work well enough that the Persians could store ice in the summer in one of the hottest places in the world. Ice would be chopped from nearby mountains in huge amounts during the winter, brought down to the desert settlement, and then stored in this large ancient refrigerator. For 400 BC, this was a very impressive piece of technology. It was called a yakchal, and it was used to store ice gathered in the winters through to summer. The ice stored in these huge refrigerators was used to make chilled treats for royal Persians in the devastating heat of summer, as well as for food storage. Here's how the refrigerator worked. It was an above-ground structure made from mud brick into the shape of a dome, usually around 60 feet tall. Within the dome was an underground space with storage capacity. The space was equipped with wind catchers that channeled the wind into the structure, cooling the air temperature inside. Even if it was blistering hot outside, the inside of a yakchal would be like stepping into a walk-in fridge. The Marib Dam the Marib Dam in Yemen was once the greatest dam in the entire world. It's considered in the top 10 of the greatest engineering marvels of prehistory, a great success of human ingenuity that stretched for 1,500 feet. Ancient people in Arabia used the dam to turn what was otherwise a desert into an oasis paradise. They used the dam to irrigate roughly 100 square miles of sandy soil, something that never before had been done on such a megalithic scale. When the dam was broken and collapsed in the 6th century, it was so devastating to the region that it brought the destruction of the city of Merib, wiping out an entire kingdom. Merib was the seat of power for the kingdom of Saba. The kingdom was wildly wealthy because of their trading power along the spice route that ran between the Mediterranean and further in the east. This was only possible because of the Great Dam. The irrigation allowed the Saba to grow more crops, which produced more frankincense and myrrh, their chief exports on the spice route. It also allowed them to adequately feed their people, which was, of course, hugely important. The dam lasted even after the Sabaeans were replaced by the Himyarite, but only until around 570. Lasting somewhere around 1,000 years makes it one of the most successful building projects in human history. Ancient Prosthetics Prosthetics are by no means a new invention. This is actually an ancient technology that goes back at least 3,000 years. Two decades ago, when archaeologists were excavating a burial chamber in an ancient Egyptian necropolis near Luxor, they came across an exquisitely made prosthetic of a big toe. It had been fitted to a woman who was the daughter of an important Egyptian priest. The artifact is now known as the Cairo Toe, and it's the oldest prosthesis that's ever been found. In modern times, researchers used computer tomography and x-ray scans to get to the bottom of how the toe was made. They created a 3D mock-up of the device, identified which materials were used in its creation, and saw how it was crafted. They even learned that the toe had been refitted several times to perfectly match with the woman's foot. According to the press release from the University of Basel in Switzerland, the artisan who crafted the toe must have been really familiar with human physiognomy. The toe came complete with a robust belt strap to keep it in place. It was carved to have a natural look while still being comfortable. It also probably helped the woman in her everyday life. It's doubtful the toe was only for looks, but probably improved her balance and made walking a lot easier. The Barbegal Mill There is an ancient ruin at the Roman site of Barbegal that was once a water mill, an amazing piece of technology that allowed the Romans to harness the power of water. It's located near the small French town of Arles and was likely employed by the Romans for industrial use in the 2nd century AD. There are also two ancient aqueducts nearby, which likely supplied the city with almost unlimited water. The mill was a huge complex built against the slope of a hill, complete with 16 water wheels. These water wheels utilized water coming in from the aqueducts to power a flour mill. It was an industrial scale operation way before its time. In fact, the Barbagal mill has been called the greatest concentration of mechanical power anywhere in the ancient world. What was the flour mill used for? For making bread, of course! 
This was the center of bread making in all of ancient Roman occupied France. Experts have estimated about 4.5 tons of pure flour was made per day thanks to the advanced engineering of the mill. That was enough bread for up to 10,000 people a day, meaning the residents in this ancient Roman city had an abundance of bread. They had unlimited flour and water, two commodities most people could only dream of having a constant supply of 2,000 years ago. Thanks for watching! Which of these ancient technological marvels impressed? you the most? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye!